Hey, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us at our first Nadiosa webinar for 2023. We're very happy and excited that you could join us this afternoon for a very interesting and exciting session uh, discussing something that's, I think, been on the minds of almost everybody that I've spoken to um, in terms of, of, of the new AI tools that have come around recently and what their impacts um, and will be around learning and teaching going forward. So we're very excited. Um, my name is, is Greg Krull. I'm part of the Nadiosa executive team and I'm the host for this afternoon. And we thank you for joining us this afternoon. We will be recording this session and sharing it with everyone who registered. We're very excited and pleased to welcome back Professor Mahabale um, from the um, American University in Cairo, who was a presenter at a webinar for us in 2021, so just under two years ago, which was a great session around um, care and compassion around learning design. So we, we look forward to having you back and thank you so much, Prof. Bale, for coming back and sharing with us. Today's focus is, is, as I said, going to be around navigating writing in online and distance learning in an age of AI. Um, and if you joined early, you would have heard uh, Ma and I discussing just some of the, the, the challenges in keeping up in the space in terms of the new AI tools that are coming out and, and how we can support our students and our fellow lecturers in, in knowing, um, you know, what we, what we could be doing, what we should be doing and some of the guidelines around. So we'll, we'll discuss some of those issues this afternoon. Um, so just before I hand over to Maha, so we will be making use of the chat. So you're welcome, and I see a couple of people are saying good afternoon. So you're welcome to introduce yourself into the chat. Um, we'll also, um, Maha will also be using Slido for some um, questions and, and, and polls and things. So we'll also have that. Um, you won't be able to unmute yourself, but when we get to points in the discussion, um, if you just type M into the chat, M for mouse um, or M for mic, um, if you just type into the chat M, we can then, um, uh, unmute you and you can come in and talk as if you, if you want to do that as well. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Mahaba, and looking forward to the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm going to start sharing my slides and this is hopefully going to be an interactive presentation. Uh, feel free to, if you like anything from the slides and you want to put it on social media, just attribute it to me. This is my Twitter handle, Bali underscore Maha, and I'm going to give you the link to the slides in a minute, um, and you can reuse these if you need to, as long as you attribute me. Um, I like to stay, start by saying assalamu alaikum. That works. It's peace be upon you. Works for any time of day, although we're exactly on the same time zone. Um, and also, I was in South Africa just before the pandemic, and so I learned about Sawabunga and Sani Bonani. Mulwaini, I don't know if I'm saying anything correctly, but I, I hear most of you are from South Africa, so trying to, to remember the few words that I know uh, from there. And I always like to start by asking, how are you feeling today? Um, even you know during the pandemic, most difficult times, that was always an important question. I think we're still, uh, we still need to ask people how they're feeling. So you can either use Slido, you can either use the QR code if you have your phone, with you, you can just uh, scan the QR code, or you can go to slido.com and enter the code, which is 9130444. Thank you, Greg, for putting that in the chat. Suffering, exhausted, stressed, you're a very honest group. Yes, I'm exhausted too, <laughs> actually. Positive, I'm glad, happy, yeah. I'm excited to be with you, but still exhausted. So I can be both at the same time. Tired is a big one. Content is coming up. So somebody asked, put it in the question and answer. That's not gonna work. But blessed, uh, good, thanks, and you. Thank you for asking about me. Worried, overwhelmed, low in energy, under pressure. Exhausted, trying to stay afloat, overwhelmed, but grateful on top of the world. I'm so happy for you. I wonder why. Need a holiday, drained. Drain is coming up again. Mixed feelings, yeah. Thriving, it's good. But less tired and exhausted, these are the biggest words. Uh, there's a little bit of overwhelm and gratitude and positivity and excitement and happiness, surviving. Some people in the chat saying blessed, exhausted, and juggling a lot, reflecting, confused, 
Yeah, breakthrough of the masters, congratulations. Charles, is it? Congratulations. Drained and overwhelmed and all of that. Hey, thank you all so much. <laughs> Somebody wrote wealthy for payday. I don't know that wealthy is a feeling, but it's good that you're feeling wealthy. Yeah, have, happy Ramadan also to those who practice. Thank you, Soraya. Okay, so what to expect? This can be an interactive session. I already have a lot of questions that I want to ask you, but also feel free to write things in the chat. You don't need to use the Q&A for now. Um, I, I can look at the chat um, and I will do that a lot during the session. Um, we'll talk about attitudes towards AI and its uses in education. We'll have a discussion around developing key AI literacies. And you'll have a choice towards the end between doing hands-on exploration demo, digging deeper into how we use AI in particular ways, or an opportunity to consult with, uh, you know, with each other on key challenges you expect to face, right, with AI in your teaching. So this is a link to my slides, uh, which, as I said, you can... Um, you can reuse parts of it and just attribute them to me. I have no problem with that. All right, so um, metaphors and AI is something that I like to talk about a lot. I like metaphors in general. Um, my mother is a medical doctor. She has nothing to do with education or AI and she doesn't truly understand what AI is, but she says that she thinks AI is like fast food. And so I'm curious, in what ways do you think AI is like fast food? You can tell me in the chat. In what ways is AI like fast food? This metaphor that she gave for AI really inspired me um, to start using this in my workshops and keynotes. In what ways is AI like fast food? Tell me in the chat. Readily available, yes. Quickly available, quick and easy, no cooking time needed, instant answers, yes. Cheap and easy, quick. Quick, quick instant gratification, but can cause indigestion later. I like that, Judith. Quick gratification, no need to put in any work to get what you want. Enjoy it even though you didn't make it yourself. Convenient, but not as done yourself. Yeah, lazy, instant tempting. Get what you want quickly. Anytime service, quick response, quality might be problematic, sometimes very unhealthy. Immediately gratifying, but can lead to laziness to cook later. Think, yeah, have to limit consumption, use with care, toxic, all of those things, right? So I think that was a good metaphor that she used. <laughs> Clearly from what you've said, there's a lot to be said about how we could tackle AI in that way. Um, well, what would be a metaphor that you would use for AI? Can you think of another metaphor for AI? I know this is not something that all 105 of you will come up with, but if someone can think of something, you put it on Slido or you can put it here. Someone's saying, uh, interesting, so it's a scary problem solver. Okay, what else? Future of everything, a microwave. Yeah, because it cooks fast also. <laughs> Machine takeover. Okay, black box, because we don't know how it works or learns, right? You get what's out of it, but you don't know what's happening inside. An ocean wave, I like that. It's overwhelming us and could drown from it. Co-pilot, uh, I've heard this one. This is an interesting one. This is a very positive view of AI, I think. Uh, microwave again, robot overlords taking over. That's like you're watching too much sci-fi. Huh? Revolutionary, thought partner, call a friend. I am legend, so that's another movie. Support tool confused for replacement of sentience. Yeah, I think that's true. It's, it's over in that sense. Smart personal assistant, teleporter. Hmm, interesting teleporter. Cheap labor, drone, treasure, chest. Uh -huh. All right. And some people are talking in the chat. I don't know what acne learning means. The wind, you know where it comes from, where it blows, can be refreshing or destructive. I like that. You know not where it comes from or where it blows. Right. I like that, Judith Moore. Ignorance is bliss. Uh -huh. Soraya. Um, augmentation to thought processes. So Fatima is saying not her metaphor, but you like king of pastiche. I have no idea what that means. I have to look that up later. Okay. Tell me in the chat later what does king of pastiche mean? Uh, someone said futuristic. All right. So now I want to ask Chachitiana.
of course, two months ago, most of us were barely there. And, uh, and now people are in a different space. So could you please answer this one on Slido? It's really hard to do this one without Slido, I think. Doing it in the chat would be hard. Ah, Fatima, thank you for explaining pastiche. So visual art, literature, theater, music, or architecture it imitates the style or character of a work of one or more or other artists. And that's a really good um, way to describe how things like DALI and Mid Journey work, right? The visual AIs, not the text ones, but the text ones, of course, do that as well. So I see that only 16 people voted on Slido, and a lot of them are saying they're not familiar and have never used any of the AI tools. What about others? I know a lot of people answered the question about, oh, 45 now. Okay, it was just slow updating on my side, I think. But still, a lot of people are not familiar. That is very interesting. I think nobody's an expert. Like, very few people are experts. I see that, like, 4% of people are calling themselves experts. I think it's hard. That's, like, two people who are saying that. I think, yeah, I've used it a lot. I still don't know who's an expert, really. There's maybe a couple of people I know in my life that I would consider experts for sure. Um, even if you're, I'm, I'm originally a computer scientist before I moved to the field of education. I have a PhD in education, but my bachelor's is in computer science and it was a machine learning neural network. Uh, I still consider myself like I understand how AI works, but I'm still not an expert on using things like chat GPT or whatever. But I think maybe I'm thinking about its impact on education a lot. So maybe people think I'm an expert on that, but not the tools themselves, if that makes sense. So the fact that we have some people who are more familiar than others means we have a lot to learn from each other here. Um, yeah, a lot of us have been dabbling with it, but who has time to master it, right? Very few people have time to actually do that. So it'll depend on what your position is. And I don't know, actually, how many of you, like, what do you teach? Are you, I'm an educational developer. So my role at my institution is mainly to support other teachers with their teaching. But I also teach a course on digital literacy. So we talk about it with students in my class. Um, but I know people who teach language or who teach writing, for them, this is a huge deal, right? So if you want to tell me in the chat, like, what do you do? Do you teach writing? Do you teach something else? Uh, do you teach something regular, but that has a lot of writing in it? Are you concerned because you teach in distance education in general, regardless of whether you teach writing or you teach something else? I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, I'm going to move on, but I hope that some of you will tell me this in the chat. So. All right, and then this next question is about how you feel, right? So we have instructional designers, supporting students with academic integrity, teaching auditing to, uh, yeah, okay, teaching music. So we have a spectrum, right? Teaching academic literacy, academic support. All right, teach communication skills that involves a lot of writing, of course. Faculty of law, quality assurance, learning designer, curriculum development. All right, so a lot of you are in positions where you're supporting other people and some of you um, you teach yourself, so that's helpful. Teach English, right? Your master's research was an AI adoption K-12. So interesting, Charles. Okay, curriculum specialist, lecturer. All right, here in practice of distance education. Okay, and lecturers in different fields, I guess. And academic advisors. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so generally, how do you feel about the latest advances in AI? What are some some key keywords you would use to describe how you feel about it? You can type in the chat or type in Slido, whatever is easier for you. All right, daunting, exciting, worried, excited for the future, daunted, exciting, apprehensive, anxious, replaced, excited, happy for the automation but worried I cannot keep up, intimidated, not sure, moving at a rapid pace, concerned, promising, dangers regarding academic integrity, excited but skeptical, critically skeptical, anxious, exciting, and scary, curious, overwhelmed, fascinated, curious, but a little apprehensive, mixed feelings, yeah, anxious, enthusiastic, intimidated, cautious, excited but skeptical, somewhere between excited and worried, yeah, I think the somewhere between excited and worried or excited but skeptical is quite common and normal, I would say, like you can see there's room for that. The mixed feelings is quite common as well. The anxiety is common. Um, yeah, very nice. Okay, thank you all very much. And I will check the chat as well. Intimidation, threshold of a massive shift. Yeah, excitement, apprehension, anxiety. Yeah, 
and the anxiety is very real. All right, I'm seeing the excitement seems to be more than all the other things, but the other things are so many different feelings like anxiety and, and skepticism and so on um, together. And the curiosity is good to have always. I would say. There's a few people still typing, so I'm just gonna wait a couple of minutes to let them finish typing. Very skeptical and wait and see. And skeptical. All right. And this last one, I think this is the last one of the polling questions before I start presenting, which is what do you think educators should do about AI in the short term? Should they ban students from using it, convince students to avoid using it, allow students to use it freely or use it with citation or use it in some context, but not others, or allow its use with transparency about the process and when it was used or develop critical AI literacy. You can choose more than one thing, by the way, not just you can choose more than one thing. Very nice to hear. Awesome. Get themselves killed, Julian. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I didn't. This was all about what are we going to do with students? But you're right. We need to. Uh, just make sure the teachers do something with themselves first before they decide what they're going to do with the students, right? Uh, in my institution, we gave something like nine workshops in February, just about AI. And we gave a panel in March. We published a couple of newsletters about it. We've been sending them emails. And still some of them didn't come to any of that. And then they discovered like by mid-March that, oh, I should have maybe learned about this AI thing. So yeah, Julian's saying about infusing it. All right, so it looks like the majority of people who have responded would like to use AI with transparency about the process and how and when it's used. And I, I wonder if for other people, it's the same as me. It's not just about attribution as much as I also wanna learn how students are using it. Um, I've been discovering the ways they use it now and it's more complex than I thought. They don't just put something through ChatGPT and submit it. They do that and then they put something through Quillbot to paraphrase it. And then they also use things like Grammarly. They use a combination of things. And that seems to be the thing that they do. It's a cocktail. It's not just one thing. I'm also happy to see that a lot of people think about uh, developing critical AI literacy. I think that's going to be important for both us and students and professionals in general. Uh, a lot of people saying using it with citation and using it in some contexts, but not others. And some people, very few, like 12% are saying um, use it freely and 2% about banning and 2% about convincing them not to use. And there's others who I think probably typed in the chat about infusing it. Okay, very interesting. All right, so I think before we get into anything, I think it's important to recognize the inequity in AI globally. And there's a lot of dimensions of that. First of all, AI that we've been using for many years, not just the AI we have right now, but for many years, the AI was racist, ableist, sexist. It has assumptions and it includes even large language models like ChatGPT. These are all based off of data sets and approaches and ways of doing things that have these elements of racism and ableism and sexism. Uh, some of the inequalities that are very clear to me about AI is biased data sets, right? So, Whatever they try to do, the majority of the content that this AI has been fed is mostly white Western English content. It's inaccessible in some locations. So Egypt, technically, ChatGPT is not available in Egypt. I assume it is available in South Africa and in other African countries. It's not available in Egypt. It's not available in Saudi Arabia for some reason. Um, and so to be able to access ChatGPT here, people need to use a VPN and pretend uh, to be in another country and then to verify your account, they send the text to somebody else's number or they create a virtual phone number. So actually not everyone has access here because not everyone has the digital literacies to use a VPN and, and do all these stuff, right? But there are other obviously writing tools that are not ChatGPT that they have access to. Um, it also reproduces some oppressions historically, for example, with face recognition, it has been less accurate at detecting darker skin a uh, criminal justice system in the US reproduces discrimination against African Americans. Uh, search engines we know are also quite biased and they're extractive because they learn from users. They give it to us for free, but then they take our data, they learn this, how we use it, 
And then they try to, um, the other thing is when you think about chat GPT and I think GPT, the original, like not the original, but like, you know, the 3.5 version versus the new version, which is, which is version four, they write, they don't write the best text ever, but they write like students write. And what Brenna Clark Gray is telling us is, we trained our learners to write like robots following patterns and scripts and worrying less about content and the fact that it looks like an essay. And so shockingly robots are also good at writing like robots. Because when we ask students to do stuff that's very prescriptive, it's easy for something like an AI to do that. Um, the other thing I wanna say about OpenAI as the company that created ChatGPT, I wanna call this company a wolf in sheep's clothing because they had some unethical practices that they went through in the process of trying to create an AI that's more ethical, that doesn't use swear words, that doesn't perpetuate violence. Um, I don't know if anybody knows this story, uh, but in the process of creating or, you know, ChatGPT and DALI, um, they hired, they contracted out to a company called Sama in Kenya. And the workers were, first of all, very underpaid, but more importantly, those workers had to see a lot of really traumatic content that they had to filter out. So it was manually done, like by humans, not by the AI itself, to filter out content that is offensive or problematic or violent. And so in the process of doing that, those people had to read a lot of really traumatic content, and their mental health was affected by it, and then the company didn't do enough to support them after that. So this is an unethical practice that this company has done in the process of producing this tool that, for the most part, doesn't swear at you. Uh, doesn't like to speak in racist ways, but the way it was trained was not very ethical to do that. And so I see that a lot of you are already talking about transparency and assessment, so I don't think we need to talk too much about this, but I think in general, um, when we're when we're assigning things for students, at the moment, I think since, as you know, I was talking to Greg before we went live, is that we don't really have control over our students using it or not using AI. So being transparent is maybe the best way if they're going to use it. We want to know how they used it, how much is their own ideas, how much is their own words, and how much came from the AI. That is probably, I think, the easiest way to go um, if what you're teaching in your class is not writing per se. So if you're teaching something else and they have to write something to represent their learning, um, to me personally, this is something I'm like, yeah, use the AI, just let me know how you've used it. And as I learn from the ways they're using it, I will modify my guidelines to make sure that I, you know, I make sure they've done the actual learning that comes with it. So I learned recently that my students, if they have a, an article that's uh, long or difficult to read, they'll put it through the AI to summarize it for them, to help them. And there are different types of AI that do that, right? There's illicit, there's typeset.io, which I learned from, from someone in South Africa, actually. Um, and uh, and sometimes even ChatGPT itself or similar tools, you can give it something and ask it to paraphrase it or or summarize it in a shorter form so that you can digest it more easily. I don't mind. Uh, it's it's a problem if students are supposed to be doing deep reading as part of the course, but if it's going to help them do the assignment and they understand better that way, then I'm okay with it. Okay. Now, Sarah Elaine Eaton in uh, in Canada says that she she does a lot of research on academic integrity, and so she says. trying to determine where the human ends and where the artificial intelligence begins, right? She's talking about a post-plagiarism era. And she thinks that the historical definitions of plagiarism will be transcended by what's happening with AI and policies have to adapt. She talks about how, um, I'm going to I'm gonna give you the link to her post on this, and I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Um, you can read my article responding to hers uh, also, which I'm going to put in the chat. Um, okay. So these are just thinking about what would happen in the future if we go beyond what we have now and AI becomes just entrenched as part of our lives. How much control do we as humans need to retain an agency? Um, I don't agree with everything she says, so you can read uh, my article and hers uh, to know more about that. Now, the other thing I wanted to share with you is when I introduce AI to my students, I want them to understand how it works and how it learns. So I usually play this game called Quick Draw. If you've never tried this game before, you should. Uh, so I'm going to put the link to it in the chat. Um, this helps you figure out if you do it and you see what happens and then you look at other people's drawings, you'll start to sort of understand how pattern recognition AI works, which is different than, of course, um, the type of AI that's used for, for language processing, right? Large language models. Um, this one is a game to detect whether you can detect whether text is fake or real, not an AI detector, but actually you as a human being trying to figure out if this is actually written by AI or not. 
Um, and this one, I don't know if you know this, but they're also AI, and this has existed for a long time, that creates faces of people who don't actually exist. So this is a game to try to figure out if you can tell if a face is real or AI generated. So these are you know, quick and, and fun ways to introduce AI in a class um, so the students understand what it is and how it works. Another point that I want to make, though, is I think we don't automate the things we care about. So I think with AI, if my students want to use AI for something, it will probably be the thing that they think is the boring aspect. Um, I think uh, for example, there's, there was, I had my students have a choice between three different things to do. And the ones who enjoyed what they did didn't use AI at all in their writing. And the ones who really went to a boring option from the three options that I gave them, they were bored and they just used AI to, to help them write it up. And I could see very clearly that they didn't engage with the ideas, which is problematic because I want them to engage with the idea, right? But it also made me realize that, oh, well, if I give them something that's boring, to them, that's probably what they're going to do. Um, and so I think what the role of us as educators right now is to figure out which aspects of what we're doing for students is core that we want them to be motivated to do. And we need to make sure that this is stuff that they don't automate so that they learn. And then what is the boring stuff that isn't really core to what we're teaching them? And in the future, it's okay to use AI for, like for me, writing the reference section, for example, if that's going to help, if it's going to do it properly, uh, then that, that's not, yeah, that's not a core skill that I want them to learn in my class. So they can automate that, I think. Yeah, so Michael, that's a great example. Searching a library can be fun, but time consuming in terms of automating tests. I remember I, when I was an undergraduate student, I had to go up and down the stairs in the library to find things. I had to use a card catalog. I do not want to do that ever again. It was fun. And I bumped into things that I didn't mean to bump into, which is very difficult to do now if you're using Google Scholar or um, a database. But it's, you can get so many more sources much quicker, and then you can spend your time reading them deeply, right? Um, okay, let me turn off my camera if I'm breaking up. That might help a little bit. If it's still happening, let me know when I switch to another connection. All right, I'm going to skip this intentional adaptation thing, but I think it's important. Um, I think... To sort of get going with this, I think it's important for institutions to support teachers with community conversations to see what kind of concerns they have, what kind of help they need. I think we need to focus on critical AI literacy for students, which I think you've said, a lot of you have said, rather than a catch and punish lens. And to address the inequalities in AI, if there are students who have access and students who don't, then what's the unfair advantage happening there? What can we do about that? And remember this thing about never automating what we care about. Um, another thing I think is useful is to acknowledge the human sacrifice that went into using, uh, to creating ChatGPT. This was encouraged by Donna Longpa and Lori Phipps. Remember that story about the Kenyan workers who were underpaid, but also suffered mental health distress because of this. Um, another thing that I think might, some people might find useful is this article, which I didn't mean to open. Sorry, I did not mean to open that article. And now my computer is hanging up. I'm still with you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. So I'm just going to open this up my slides again because something went wrong. I clicked something by mistake and now, and now it's uh, not in a good mood. But I'll, I'll just open my slides in another window. So that link that I clicked by mistake was a group of like 45 uh, educators from all over the world. Uh, Greg, I can't remember if you were one of them. We were writing speculative futures of AI, like what could happen to education because of AI in the future. Um, so that's what we, we all wrote a positive story and a negative story. And and uh, we shared them. And this kind of synthesized a lot of uh, in, in AI. Um, the other thing that I want to share with you is what educators in my institution AI um, 
we collected what different people are doing and uh, we put them together into a newsletter so that people can know. I also think it's important to include students in the conversations around what's happening with AI uh, to see whether they, they find something that they, they have to say because they have slightly different perspectives on this and, and how it might uh, affect their lives and how it might be useful for them and how it could be problematic. Sometimes students will tell you, I don't want you to allow AI to be used in this thing, you know? Um, I'm also sharing with you here 101 creative uses, creative ideas to use AI in education if you wanted to follow through on that. And you can contribute to it as well if you want to. All right, so we still have half an hour. So there are no breakout rooms because we're in Zoom, uh, we're in Zoom webinar, uh, but we can either spend time trying prompts on ChatGPT in the main room so that people who have never seen ChatGPT before uh, can experience that. Uh, or we can spend time, you can ask questions and we can, uh, obviously you won't be discussing with colleagues because it's we can't do breakout rooms, but we can do uh, another kind of discussion right here. Or we can spend time asking each other questions. So there's actually a tool called Question Jam that would allow us uh, to ask each other questions, not just all of you asking me, me, but all of us in the room asking someone else in the room and you get a lot of questions asked and answered. All right, I'll pause while you guys... So, I mean, it's pretty obvious the majority of people would like to do uh, some ChatGPT play. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. And there will still be time towards the end to ask questions. And so here's what I'm going to suggest. If someone has some questions uh, that they want to ask me, you could, yeah, you could also ask the questions to ChatGPT as well. So, But you could ask the questions in the chat or using the Q&A. And and we'll we'll do some chat GPT play as well. So I'm gonna just open up chat GPT now. Hopefully it's working. It's been quite, it works most of the time. There was a time when it wasn't working regularly, but right now I think it usually works. Maybe a lot of people have the paid account now. So a lot of times when I do workshops and I say, um, so Trilo is saying, we don't know, we don't have enough in terms of data, clearly true to the fact that it's new. Let's go off assumptions regarding its use and dangerous potential. Yeah. Not ready to make solid conclusions until the limitations parameters are yeah, that's true. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually show you something right now that I saw recently. Um, in terms of when you first experience something like Chat GPT and how you feel about it, and then after you've seen it for a while, uh, you start to see it differently than when you first saw it. So I'll I'll share that uh, right now and then we'll we will start using ChatGPT and start thinking of prompts that you want to ask ChatGPT, right? <laughs> it's a diagram of sort of people's attitudes as they get to hear about ChatGPT and or AI in general, and then as they get to experience it and they get used to it, it's, yeah, here it is. All right, I'm going to share this. You see here? Can you see this? It's like confidence versus knowledge, right? So when you first see what comes out of ChatGPT, you're like, wow, that's amazing. And then you start understanding how large language models work and it's just statistical and it's just predicting things based on what it's seen before. And then you say, oh man, it gives so many incorrect answers. So like you're at the bottom here at number three. And then you start to see, actually, I, I understand that it doesn't get the right answer, but there are ways to make it write something better it's not perfect but it's okay and then you reach a level of enough knowledge and like medium level of confidence like you know when you can use it and when you when it won't be useful and it can help you with certain things but not, not everything so i think that's I'm, at, I'm somewhere between four and five now how to make your assessments chat gpt proof i would love, love to hear what you're thinking about in terms of that michael especially that gpt4 is even more powerful right so how do we rethink student assessments so that they don't rely on ai 
So this is something I, let's ask that to chat GPT and we can talk about it, right? So I'll, I'll share my screen while I do chat GPT. So how do we rethink our assessments so the students don't rely on AI? Is it okay if I put that one into chat GPT? And this is, um, this is a question that um, I've given workshops, entire workshops on just that. And I think the main thing for me is intrinsic motivation, like choose something that the students care about that they want to learn about so they do actual research. Make them do things other than writing. Make them go out into the world and interview people. Um, make them do something that will have impact on people. You know, like do a project where the output will actually benefit a real community. Um, and actually, ChatGPT is saying something similar. It's like focus on project-based assessment. So rather than tests and exams or essays or whatever, something that demonstrates understanding in a more practical context, the more applied and nuanced and contextual it is, the less likely ChatGPT will do well, allow them to produce something in visual and, and audio forms, not just writing. But sometimes what you teach is writing, so that's kind of difficult. And I think also when you ask them to do something personal that's, that's relevant to them, that helps. Uh, the second point that ChatGPT is saying is performance-based assessment. So focusing on demonstration of skills and abilities, the real world context. So the similar to what I was saying, right? Role play, simulation, oral presentations, that kind of thing. Uh, it also says implementing portfolio assessment. So collecting, evaluating work over time. I don't know how that helps though. I don't agree with ChatGPT on that one. Providing opportunities for self-assessment so the students reflect on their own. I still don't know how that's going to help with AI. Incorporating peer assessment, I still don't think that's going to help with AI. So I don't like that answer very much. I like the first couple of suggestions it came up with. Um, but yeah, I'm just saying, first of all, ChatGPT uses this word ultimately a lot. So I had a student who wrote something with AI and she didn't disclose that she'd used AI. Hi, Nicola. <laughs> yeah, if it has Google we'll answers, make sure. Yeah. Definitely. I think if something is Googleable or available in places like Course Hero or Check, ChatGPT's probably seen something like that. Yeah. Yeah, the answers are sometimes good. They're they're not usually horrible. It depends on the kind of question you ask. But if you ask something very specific to South African history, maybe that isn't very well known, it's probably not going to get it right. It doesn't do well in Egyptian history, for example. Um, yeah, so if if you're, like what Michael is saying, if your assessment uses a case study with limited data and its corpus of knowledge, then students are less likely to find it on Google or anywhere else, right? And ChatGPT will have no access to it. So does someone have a question that they think uh, ChatGPT would not be able to answer very well? I'd love to see this. That's a good point, Chulu. Like, if you, you change the medium, obviously, if they have to write it by hand, but then that's not possible for everything, right? It's possible for some things, but not for other things. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Greg. So, if someone wants to speak aloud, they can type um, and they will unmute you. Someone tell me something that you th think ChatGPT might not have a lot of information about. Yeah, GPT-4 is doing better on contextual scenarios. I, I've only seen it once. I don't have access to it myself. I think it's only in the paid version. I can't get the paid version um, because I'm in Egypt, apparently, also. Ah, so the student provides a profile of themselves or if it's scenario in the prompt, they can get a plausible answer. That is so interesting. Yeah, and it doesn't have information after 2021. That's true as well. Mm -hmm. I, we have a lot of people who who do in um, this tests in, in person, that's a lot of people are, are going to that as well, like what Michael is describing. But yeah, so I mean, even what you're describing there, Fatima, you can do it a little bit with GPT 3.5, like the version that we have right now. So for example, Michael, what's this in the chat? That's a lot, I can't read all that. Oh, that's the kind of thing you ask students to do. You wanna ask this question to chat GPT? Let's do it and see what happens. Let's see what happens there. Okay, so first of all, it says, as an AI language model, I do not have access to the specific context of that school, uh, which I assume is written in Afrikaans, but I can provide some general suggestion on how to implement social science intermediate CAPS document in a grade five classroom and adapt planning assessment and teaching approaches. So tell me if it's doing a good job, Michael. Maybe this is a situation where 
you need to type in the um so you can tell me or you can say in the chat. Fatima, are you saying that your students paid for more sophisticated access or that you, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're Fatima or Fatima, so sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Uh, so Michael wants to unmute, if that's possible. So essentially, if the student uses, the student uses um, they will have failed the assessment. Because mm -hmm. this so is a very generic answer, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because the, the answer is just giving them the tools that I actually want them to apply according to a specific context. So the rubric will only award the marks according to application uh, while considering a context. Yeah. So giving me the tools that I want them to use yeah. is not even, not even an introduction or even five marks out of 50. It's it's yeah. zero because it's not, it's not meeting yeah. any of the requirements for marks at this stage. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just regurgitating the, the basics. Yeah, it's, it's basically repeating repeating the module guide back to me, not not the not the, mm -hmm. uh, the answer exactly. I want. Awesome. And this is a real school, right? Not a hypothetical school. It is a real school, but it's one that I have a lived experience of. But the what's available on the internet mm -hmm. is limited. There's only a few web pages, but there's enough data there but they mm. will have to analyze it themselves the problem is the data is right. like a google map thing there's a facebook page it's kind of data that either won't be right. in the corpus of knowledge yes. or the ai yes. they will be will find it difficult to analyze it's yes that boring. makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense thank you for providing that example you're welcome so it's the contextualization and also asking them to do the higher order work and not just regurgitate stuff that they could probably also google and stuff i agree all right. What else do people want to try with ChatGPT? One of the one of the funny things is I sometimes you can make it write like with Shakespearean language. Has anyone tried that before? So use Shakespeare style language to discuss the impact of Instagram on girls' mental health in Egypt, for example. So you see that? Oh, whoa, it's tied. The pressing matter grips my heart with fierce concern as I observe the distressing influence of Instagram on the tender minds of young maidens in Egypt. Or Seth, I don't even know what that word means. <laughs> this wretched platform doth breed the noxious tides of despair and woe. So I think they're creative. I think it's interesting uh, to do it that way. Has anyone ever tried using ChatGPT to create a syllabus? So it's actually not bad at that either. So Fatima is saying, now all courses can integrate recent information effectively true. Extremely difficult. What do you teach, Fatima? You have 450 students, but what do they, what do you teach them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the problem, I think, is a lot of what ChatGPT produces is passable. Uh, so I don't know. Advise them, oh, so it's about someone else. Provides the module guide. It took five working days per guide the, without ChatGPT, obviously, I'm assuming, but yeah. It's good at providing lesson plans. Yeah, I, I find that, especially if it's maybe K to 12, because a lot of that is probably already provided. So create a syllabus for a, like something like a very common thing, like microeconomics, for example, course with uh, two exams and three projects. For example, I'll just do that. And the thing is, if you're someone who teaches microeconomics, you probably know how to do a syllabus on your own. But what you can do with something like this is that use it and then tweak it. It's like it's giving you a template to work with. It might give you some ideas. It writes very good learning outcomes, by the way. Uh, if you're anyone who's like an instructional designer or you support other people with their teaching, you might uh, discover that it actually does better on. Uh, learning outcomes than actual teachers because they're not used to writing good learning outcomes necessarily. Um, and then it does like very generic things like exam one covers topics from the first half of the course and exam two covers topics from the second half of the course, which is like, really? That book may or may not exist. This is one of the very tricky things with, uh, with ChatGPT is like it makes up references. And there are other AIs like perplexity.ai that doesn't do that. This looks to be a real book. So it's probably had enough experience with uh, with books. Oh, it's trying to sell me ChatGPT. By the way, I have a Chrome extension. Can you see this on the right-hand side of my Google? This is ChatGPT that I can use next to Google and I can compare both together. It's just a, an extension on Chrome. Um, it's not barred or anything. It's just a ChatGPT extension inside Chrome. 
yeah, it can be a good starting point. It can create a passable rubric. I think some people uh, have used it to actually give feedback on writing, but I'm not really sure how that works. I've never done it that way. Um, I was gonna, I want to show you this other tool called perplexity.ai, uh, which is not as good at writing as ChatGPT, but it creates real references. Um, this one doesn't create real references for the most part. And there's another one called you.com slash chat, which does a little bit of both. It sometimes creates real references and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so it depends. Um, then there are other, the ones that I was telling you about that would help someone read, typeset.io, which Nicola Pollock is with us today, is the one who introduced me to this one. This helps someone read. Uh, when you're reading, a, you upload a PDF and it summarizes that for you, which is really useful. Or you can ask it questions also. So I can answer questions about that. Okay. Um, what else? What else? What else would people like to see? And oh, one of the other things that I think is interesting is this regenerate option. So we've created it, and here is the you know the projects and stuff. It doesn't give you the course topics. You can ask it, uh, can you create this again and include the course topics, or you could just regenerate and see what it comes up with. Another version of the course, right? It's gonna have pretty different answers. And this means that, you know, if, if a student and another student are using it together, they can create two different assignment answers for them, right? Have the same breakdown. <laughs> well, no, it's slightly different, actually. It doesn't have the extra credit thing. And it's giving me the format of the exams and the time. The other ones didn't do that, the previous one didn't have that. Sometimes it comes up with really interesting project ideas for classes too, by the way. So I've done that. I've also used it to help me um, brainstorm titles for workshops to make them more interesting. Um, I've used it to help me do outlines for workshops. It's not that good, but sometimes helps me realize something that I'm missing. Um, when I was teaching my class this semester, I also asked it to brainstorm ways to do guidelines for AI use in the classroom. And I gave it two sets of instructions. I said, give me one that is permissive to students and give me one that isn't permissive to students. And I, I looked at them, they're not bad. Okay, I think maybe it's time to stop uh, showcasing ChatGPT. I hope that was still helpful to, to most of you. And come back to, I'm almost done. So I just wanted to know what's the key takeaway um, for you? from today um, and just type that for me in the chat while I share my slides one, one last time. What's the key takeaway that you got from today? Something useful and then we'll, we'll make some time for questions as well. And then, you know, I wanna end this with a thank you. And I, if I can say this correctly in Kosi, and I don't know how to say the rest. Miabonga? Am I saying this right? I'm not really sure. Um, and I'm going to put the link to my slides in the chat one more time. Um, but I, I do want to listen to your questions and comments and Thank, take away. And thanks, Ma. Yeah, as, as someone said in the chat, was the pronunciation is not too bad and, and it's close enough. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. So. Um, colleagues, if you've got any questions, I know people are probably typing in the chat now, um, there's sort of key takeaways, but if you've got um, sort of uh, questions or comments from Maha, then please put those into the chat or just type M in the chat and we can then let you to unmute. While we're doing that, maybe I'll just kick off and just uh, two thoughts that sort of came to me as, a, as I was, as I was um, listening to you, Maha. The first was, you know, obviously, as you said in one of your slides, it's really important that we help our students start to develop critical AI literacies. Um, but my question is, how do we help our students develop those literacies when we ourselves are still unfamiliar largely with those literacy, those AI literacies ourselves? So yeah. maybe a sort of comment or thought about that. Yes, yes, sure. So one of the things is, um, if in my slides, First of all, uh, there's a lot of links here to things that students could read with you. I think it's okay to talk to students while we don't know something that we're all learning together. Um, one of the things, so there, there are lots of dimensions of the critical AI literacy. One of them is how do we get better at using it for productivity or to help us? And what are its limitations? And we have to keep relearning the limitations because the limitations change, right? So GPT-4 is much 
more powerful than what we had what we had two months ago well i guess a week ago right so it's moving very fast but i think as we do it what i do in my class is sometimes i open up the ai and we start doing things i ask them to do something manually and then we do it with the ai and then we compare and we get to see oh well what you've created has your voice and it has these nuances the ai has good ideas but they're repeated ideas they're not new it's never going to come up with a new idea really it's just if someone's done it before then it's seen in the data you know so they get to see that experience um, I think asking them to disclose to us how they're using it is going to help them metacognitively, you know, think about their own thinking and how they're learning and how it might be affecting or interrupting their learning or helping their learning. Um, so my boss and I both came to this conclusion around the same time is that if you always start by asking the AI to give you an outline for something before you start thinking about it, you're not giving yourself a chance to think creatively. So if it's something that isn't creative and you just need to get it done really quickly, it's fine. But if it's something that you're actually good at and you're going to enjoy doing the thing, give yourself a chance to think. And then when you get stuck, come to the AI, right? Um, there's another AI tool called Pseudowrite that's existed for some, some time. And you start writing a story and then you ask it to continue the story for you. And it gives you several options and you choose from that. And that can be helpful to a writer who has writer's block, right? The other thing is to be critical of the AI. There's a lot of articles out there about critical AI literacy as in understanding the privacy concerns, understanding um, the data and all of that, I think we could read up and, and, and struggle with together. But I think it's totally okay to be learning along with our students. And it's exciting for them to see uh, that you'll want to learn with them uh, rather than you're not going to talk. Because a lot of people are like, I'm not going to talk about it until I know more. And they don't have time to get to know more. But for every discipline, there's an opportunity for AI somewhere. And maybe when they go out into the professional world, they need to be ready for it. So we need to help them get ready for it. Okay, so I'm going to read some of the stuff in the chat. Um, the takeaways I'm just going to read uh, on my own, but a lot of people saying it can be fun, has potential to help them. Yeah, you know more in experiments, I think definitely before you make that final judgment. And what I do with people, okay, what are your assignments? Let's try those on ChatGPT. How can we modify the assignment? And I, I you know, keep digging deeper and deeper and try to prompt the AI. There's now a LinkedIn course on uh, prompt engineering that's now a thing how do you prompt ai well and then you can buy a hundred prompts for i don't know how many dollars so these are new things like we didn't we never heard of this before um okay what else i, I think that's that's a good point just to pick up on that I, you know it is one talking about critical ai literacies one of those is how to use the tools and one of those things is you know the same when when Google first came out, or even the search engines before that, um, you know, people would type in, how can I do this? And then we had to learn how to use the search engines to, to get what we were mm -hmm. actually looking for. Um, and then I think right. that's the same with, with the AI tools is we need to develop that skill in terms of, you know, the prompt engineering. And I, and I see there are a couple of courses and resources available out there on how to, to get better at, at giving the right sort of prompts. And I think also, the other thing that is that is that, as you said earlier, is once you start to use ChatGPT for a while, it starts to almost pick up on 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 how you interact with it, and it starts to sort of um, respond slightly in different ways yes. than than the sort of first time that you use it. Yeah, I want to show you guys um, this newsletter by someone called Ethan Mollick. Uh, he is really good at off. Like oh, learning prompts. LearnPrompting.org. Okay, <laughs> I did not know that site. Uh, he he gives examples of how, as a teacher, you could use ChatGPT for your own learning and stuff. So it's, it's very interesting what he's uh, what he's been talking about. He's been doing a lot of good stuff um, with this. Ah, so this is a Discord. Very interesting. Very very nice. Thank you for sharing that, Fatima. Work smart, not hard. Yeah. Good point. Yes, right, exactly. You still have to think critically. It's not going to be able to think critically for you. But for the little stuff that takes time for no reason. I see a lot of people say using it for email. I'm worried that someone uses it for email and then they commit to doing something they don't want to do. <laughs> you know. But um, I know there are add-ons for email as well. Radical changes, I agree, Estelle. These are going to be radical changes. Um, what's the point of people still doing so? Oh, I think. You know, I know, I've known for a while that some uh, music artists use 
AI to support them. So they have some elements of their own creation and some from the AI. I know some graphic designers do the same thing. I think what AI produces for graphic design and AI is never going to be as good as a professional person doing it, but they can be good for non-professionals to use, which is a problem, obviously, for the labor market for those people. But also um, that it's it can augment. I think the augmented uh, thinking is not a bad way to go. Like, how can it help? Because when you think about it, there's a lot of stuff we do now that even you, anything you think about now, even when we say when we brainstorm, sometimes you brainstorm by going to Google and looking at what other people have done, and then you decide what you're going to do. The difference between that and the AI is that the AI distilled what Google would have given you into very, very few points, right? But you would have done it yourself. The difference is when you do it yourself, you get exposed to more, you take more time with it. And the time you take on something helps your learning and helps you think better so it's it's up to us to decide like when is this gonna help me and when's it gonna harm the problem is with very young people who may run to it right away like i know students use something like quillbot all the time instead of paraphrasing and that's uh, always gonna but they if they grow up with it it's gonna be very different but also how many kids now have ever opened an encyclopedia i grew up on encyclopedias i loved encyclopedias and i love flipping through it and finding things that I wasn't looking for or flipping through a dictionary and learning words that I wasn't looking for. I, yeah, I don't think kids have that experience anymore, right? I don't know, maybe they do, but not the ones that I see. That's very nice, Charles. You get as a mind mapping tool, yeah, to get going, very interesting. Human touch is still the center, I agree. And there's this expression they use in the AI world, which is the, the human in the loop always, yeah? Yeah. All right. Is there a question that I missed or were people mainly commenting? I think it was mainly comments. We'll just, we're almost out of time. So if anyone wants to bring in a question, please do. Um, I just want to say earlier, Ma, so one of the things I found in South Africa is that I could, because I also use the free version of ChatGPT, um, is that I tend to use it in the morning because in the afternoon, once the sort of American Canadian sort of wake up, then wake up. All of, it's sort of, it sort of then becomes difficult to access. So that's also yes. so, uh, that's going true. back to, back to your, your earlier comment around the inequalities and how it affects um, people in different countries. So I've, I've mm -hmm. certainly found if I want to use it, I've got a plan to sort of use it in the morning because the afternoons are very often um, don't have access. Um, I'm not seeing any comments, but uh, yes, thanks for sharing, see, uh, sharing your email. So if you've got any comments or questions or things that you want to take, um, further, then please do. Uh, I'm sure Maha would be in, happy to be in touch with you. Um, Maha, I know you asked us to give our sort of key takeaway from today's session. So I'm going to allow you a chance to either sort of your, what you'd like us to perhaps take away or perhaps your own takeaway from, from today's session. And we'll, we'll sort of end it there. And then I've got a few announcements. So I, I think one of my takeaways is every time I give one of these things, it's really nice to see how people in different countries respond to this. Mm. Interestingly, with this particular thing, it's the same everywhere, everywhere in the world, <laughs> no matter where the audience is from. <laughs> the only difference is when we're from the global south, we're all using the free version, right? Yeah. Versus when there are people from uh, Western Europe and the US, some of them have a paid version, so they are seeing things that I'm not seeing. Um, and so that's another inequality, of course, and we're used to digital inequality, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so that's the other thing. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much to, to Maha Bali. Um, again, um, such a fantastic session today. Uh, so many resources that you've shared and, and uh, ways of thinking uh, for us to think about and explore further, which is fantastic. So we will share the session um, recording from today's session with the, the link as well as your slides where there's a lot to to um, click on links and go forward. So thank you so much. It was really a lot of people in the chat saying it was really informative, gave us new ways to think about things and, and ideas. And I think that's really fantastic. As you said earlier, this is an evolving space. Um, you know, what we know now is sort of different to two months ago and probably in a couple of months time, what we all know um, is, is there. In fact, I, I had a saw a quote last week that someone said, you know, the AI tools that we have now will never be as bad as they are now because they will constantly be evolving and new tools will be coming out. 
Um, so mm -hmm. thank you so much, Maha. It's, it's been really wonderful. I wish we could have more time with you and maybe we'll, we'll ask you back later on um, if, you're, mm -hmm. if you're willing and agreeable <laughs> and not, not tired of us um, to come back and maybe have a bit more um, time for sharing and, and discussion. Thank but you. colleagues, thank I just want to end, end off um, today's session just to um, highlight that our annual Nadiosa conference takes place 24 to 26 May. Um, and the theme this year is around uh, student success. So we're looking at four sub-themes around first year's experience, learning analytics, um, student advising, student support, um, uh, student success, anything related to that. So the call is open now. It's The call closes tomorrow, but we will probably extend it for a couple of days. So if you want to submit your abstract, please do. We're very Great. excited to be going back to a face-to-face -face conference for the first time since 2019. Um, so we will host it by the University of Pretoria, the Hrinkloof campus in Pretoria. So please do consider joining us. We'd love to see you there and probably continue some of the conversations that we've actually been having today um, as we learn, all learn more about um, ChatGPT and some of the AI tools and how we can use it both for ourselves as well as for our students in terms of learning, teaching and research. Colleagues, I'm going to leave it there then. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, um, uh, please do visit our website, nadiosa.org.za if you want more information about um, the upcoming conference or reach out to info at nadiosa.org.za. Um, if you want to follow up with anything. Thanks so much to our wonderful speaker, Professor Mahabali. As always, it's been a, a privilege and a pleasure and such fun to be with you. Um, and we look thank forward to, to talking to you more uh, further. Colleagues, thank you everyone for joining us. We hope yeah. that you have a safe and relaxing afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.